PhD here in Botany in 1967. First woman to get a PhD in Botany. She then went I thought it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do the first. <laughs> she went to Murray State University in Kentucky and uh, taught there for 33 years. years. Three years. Yeah. Eight courses? Eight, yeah. eight, 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 eight courses. Right. Anyway, I asked her to just kind of explain a little bit about her uh, teaching philosophy and how she taught at least one of her courses, and we have some handout information here. Okay. So, so I, uh, all yours. I came from Nebraska. My father was a veterinarian, and I learned by doing. He used to tell people that I could stay a dog at age 10. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that is my learning, the, the way I learned. And uh, he was my first major teacher of it. And then I came down here and was going to go into pre-med and become a doctor because there were I heard women were being accepted in the med school, finally. And uh, then I had a revelation when I was a sophomore that there were two groups of people that made me extremely nervous at that age. Old people and sick people. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like young, healthy people. So I uh, uh, decided to go into education and I was told to take this course by Robert, was that his name? Yeah, yeah. And he was in the teacher thing and uh, they told me that if I was going to teach high school biology I had to take botany. Well, fine, so I'm doing anything, just sit there and go, right? And I have a brown pump. But I met this wonderful man and teacher, probably the best teacher other than my father. John Davison, and uh, he taught the way I learned, and that makes a difference. Everybody learns differently, and uh, you learn by doing and reasoning things out and things like that. So I switched my major to botany, and uh, then I went to Kentucky and taught for. 32 years, and everybody thought I was crazy there, but that's okay, because I went down there during uh, sit-ins and all that, and I never heard of them before, really. As a, as a graduate student, you didn't watch much TV, besides it was black and white. <laughs> it was a real revelation to me. And, uh, but Doc Davidson was a thinker. And, uh, like I say, he, he believed in learning by doing, the inductive approach. He actually was, uh, uh, you know Francis Bacon? Anybody hear him? He was the one that gave us the inductive approach. And he is also credited with saying, knowledge is power. <laughs> you know, but they taught that way. You, you see. And uh, that's the way I, learn, because I don't learn traditionally. And uh, so I have tried to design my courses using the, what we used to call, what do they call it now? Inquiry. Hmm? Student-centered learning? Well, yeah, student learning. We used to call it inductive reasoning. <laughs> Inquiry. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was, uh, as you can tell, I wasn't the best lecturer in the room, but I sure had fun. Uh, and my philosophy is that learning is fun. And uh, I, this is how I met him. <laughs> he was, when I was a graduate student, he took botany. And, uh, and you guys found something, and you could just see the light bulbs, you know. And he had a good light bulb. <laughs> but anyway, so I tried to uh, uh, develop all my courses 
I, I taught eight different courses, and they kept me away from beginning biology because I was radical, okay, uh, for non-majors, and I thought they needed me most, but that's okay. Uh, but what, what uh, I would teach my course uh, 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 in the fact that I am a tool. The students, I'm a tool for them, and they, they should use me as a tool. A book is a tool. And uh, uh, I hate textbooks. But and when I review them, the first thing I would go is look in and see what the glossary was, terms of important, and uh, how good of an index they had. Because, you know, you, you read it you know, about Sologenella, you go to the index and, you know, that kind of stuff. And if you read a word you don't know, you, and you, you, you learn it as you need it. And uh, so I uh, taught, uh, I brought some things about, uh, I'm a plant systematist or a taxonomist. And one thing I, I did bring was a couple of, I gave uh, an awful lot of take home exams because I trust students. And you get stung every now and then when you trust students, but you do when you trust adults too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would uh, uh, develop the course, and uh, I think, did they get the premises thing? Uh, did they get on the premises thing? Here. Which is, was a lot of. Uh, I'm not sure we got the premises. Brock Davis in here. Yeah, that's. <laughs> premises? Yeah. I learned this from him, because he was a thinker. And we, uh, premises are very important in designing a course or a program. Mm -hmm. And generally, the uh, first time I did this, I thought, gee, everybody knows that. <laughs> everybody doesn't. You know, like plant is, the course is that. Uh, plan to be concerned with present and, pa and past. They need to know that. But the ones I really like are the, that uh, sexually derived plants can only have two parents. And we forget that all the time in biology. And we talk about population, you know, and things like that. And, uh, and if it's uh, asexual reproduction, you only have one. So they get all the genetic material where you only you lose half of your mother's and half of your father's, you know, through that process. And so it's a combination, and you're new. But you only can have two parents. And uh, that was one of the hardest concepts in the beginning. I got better at it. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, a word I learned from John was vital genes. And you got to remember when I graduated from high school, they decided that DNA was the genetic material. When I graduated from college, they decided there were two kinds of RNA. You know, and uh, so we didn't have all the background that we have nowadays. And uh, when they, I was self taught, I taught genetics for 25 years and when I got the nearest neighbor analysis of DNA, you know, trying to figure it out, I went up to a biochemist and drove him nuts because I had, he was used to just lecturing and here I am a student and, and uh, he told me he never worked so hard in his life because if I didn't understand them, I wasn't afraid to ask him and, you know, and I have to keep that in mind all the time I'm teaching. You know, I may think I know what it means, but uh, I, they may not have gotten it. You know, I'm presenting it wrong. But anyway, one, uh, you know, the zygote is to be viable, it has to have all the vital genes. Well, that was Doc's number, uh, word, and I had a lot of trouble when I went and worked with other biologists because they didn't understand the concept of the vital genes, but if you don't have one vital gene, you don't exist. 
you know. And these were just great basic things that I wanted them to keep in mind throughout the course. And whenever they did anything, uh, wrote something down, make sure you don't contradict people. And if you think I'm wrong, you come and tell me. You know, that, that kind of stuff. And so, uh, that. And then here, I define terms. I sit down and figure out the important things and uh, the underlying ones. I, the one that the students would ask me to explain the most, I say a particular specimen has the cap capabilities of function. See, an individual, to me, does not exist in time. It's the specimen. And as soon as a specimen functions, it's a different individual. And I can remember Doc when he was writing this down, that he was typing it, and he, hey, Marion, you know, came in and he says, how am I doing this as an individual? You know, because he just said he didn't exist in time. But this is something, particularly in mess, they need to know this. They won't, at one time, uh, things, uh, you're not allergic to something, then all of a sudden you get allergic to something, you know. But, you know, just little things like that. And uh, another thing that the students always thought was funny is for a, uh, a specimen to be studied, it must exist. And they sit there and think, I'm nuts. But I am, so that's okay. That's really but they need to uh, have a, a kind of a foundation which in you, that they can use through the whole course. And if they have, I give them something new, does it fit? This, and if they think they found that one of my premises or something like that isn't real, they come and tell me. You know, I'm an egoist. I'm not an egoist. <laughs> they don't know what that means. But this is a method of, then the students, you give them these concepts, give them a problem, and uh, they figure it out their way. It may not initially make sense to you, but this is learning. And I think learning is in three phases. You first got to learn memorizing. And I think it's very, very important, but I think it's uh, the, in a sense, the least important. Because I'm a lousy memorizer. But <laughs> anyway, you know, and when you design tests and things, you want to, uh, I design them in relation to this three levels I consider now. I don't know all the new terms anymore. But the second one is, is evaluating and, uh, and understanding uh, a particular phenomena or example, you know, and, and, and uh, so they, they get a process. They're learning this. And then the third one is, is you give them a situation and they go backwards, sort of, you know, and the, that, that's what I tr try to test on, I, uh, especially in our exams. I generally give uh, final exams that they take home. And uh, I also uh, 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 it, it, I give, it's comprehensive, so if, uh, if, if if they get an A on it, on the final, they get an A of a course. And like me in chemistry, I was telling the chemist over there that my chemist I just love. As a person, I'm scared to death of him, but, I, but and I finally went in and talked to him because in chemistry, I would fail all the hour exams and get B's on the final. And I told him that I knew as much as anybody else that they got a B out of that course. It just took me different. I learned different, you know. And so, but problem solving is what this kind of stuff is. Everybody does it differently. But, uh, so I always tried to make little premises. Okay, this is 
for this course. These are our fundamentals. And they need, uh, I give them copies of them. <laughs> I don't let them write them down in the book, you know, in the thing. Because these are the things in which, at that time, in uh, uh, place, these were the, the uh, premises. We change them all the time because we learn more. But in this case, it gives them the foundation. And generally, you can, uh, uh, it, this can be modified for any course in biology, I think. You know, and, but you keep those in mind when you're talking to students and when they're uh, taking the tests and, and things like that. So, so did you? Did you, did you I'm sorry, did, did, did you present these? Oh, I gave them to No, no, but I mean, <coughs> did you explain these? I mean, oh yeah, well, the I know. Uh, yeah, uh, throughout you know the first few uh, courses, you know, I uh, give it to them and I say, now read them and think about them, and then, uh, like I say, I, I I don't consider myself a good lecturer, but I'm a good explainer, and. Uh, I think uh, you know that if they don't understand that, then they can, and we it gets discussions going, and they they learn how I work and I learn how they work, and uh, but uh, you know and I I give them these things, which I had one professor tell tell me colleague, these are very esoteric. You think these are esoteric? <laughs> okay, they're so terrible. <laughs> but anyway, but it keeps you in focus because you forget sometimes. It's easier when a kid comes up and says, "How does this happen?" and you spiel off something, and you you know you spiel it off, and you're not really thinking while you're doing it, and they'll catch you later. They'll catch you. And in the you know, sense, you deserve it. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, you know, it's just uh, several things that uh, I thought were extremely important in all biology is constancy and variation in nature. And uh, uh, how do, how alike do things have to be to be the same? Have you ever thought of that? How different do they have to be to be different? It used to be, uh, I thought all penguins looked alike. You know, until I went to Antarctica and saw four of them on, in one day. You know, then you have, you have, you see them and then you perceive them in relation to others. And as, uh, it, it, it's really important because that binds everything in the constancy, binds everything together in the living world. And the variation makes it fun. <laughs> you know? And so you have to, uh, 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 I think they need a concept of that. Because uh, when you think about it, biology is really overwhelming. You know, it, it really is. I mean, it, even when you specialize it, it's still overwhelming. But there's some constancy. And sometimes we learn something that you know, distorts that constancy, and then you have to learn, and you learn something and you modify it. But you, you have to start somewhere. And uh, students have to do this. And you don't just dump them into some of the stuff. And other things uh, in biology I think are really important <coughs> is pattern perception. You know, whenever you see anything new, it's like uh, my little brother, who's Russ. Uh, we were walking down the street in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, and they brought a Catholic school. And he was about four or five. Uh, I was a big sister, you know, I don't have brows. But anyway, he's all too numb. They were walking down the street, never seen a nun before in his life. 
you know, you craft long arms and ah, penguins! Because <laughs> it was something new. And when you see something new, you go into your file cabinet up there and see if you can fit it in and you're continually reshuffling that. That's what you do in your mind. And the students need to know that. And so if you uh, find think something is highly variable, but you find something that binds it all together, that's also learning. So going this way or that way is, you know, it's a learning experience. But one thing you have to keep in mind is don't become rigid. Don't, don't ever tell a student, by the way, uh, see I think white questions are philosophical. How, what, when, where, and how are scientific, uh, but why? Because I used to, as a kid, just say, why? And they would say, because. <laughs> you know. And uh, I learned that really early, because I say so. Well, that's a good reason, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But if you can get a why, if you have a why question, this is a beauty, and Doc used to pull this on us all the time. Uh, you get a why question, that leads to what, when, where, and how. And they can be solved. And all you have to do is be able to figure that out. And you may not have enough information at first. That's fun. Go find some more information. Yeah, I, I think learning is fun, I really do. After all these years, the most exciting thing I've ever done is learning. Okay, and I hope I so, pass it on so, to my teacher. So is, is this basically the same thing as, a, as taxonomy? Uh, this yeah, I, uh, uh, no, this was what he called systematic botany and here, and then you took taxonomy, and that's when you did what the hydrogen back, circle the sticks and all that kind of fun stuff. But your lab, this applies. What was what was the lab like that was this? Oh well, the, my lab in uh, in uh, systematics was <coughs> one one objective was for him to learn how to figure out what a plant is, <laughs> you know, and uh, that these uh, and this is how you use your data. So you have to. The, the one, uh, I forgot that, I couldn't find my stapler, is that okay? No, okay. But anyway, on the test here, this was systematic botany. You see, I would actually give them problems. This one? And give, oh, this is the one I don't know. Yeah, that, that one. I used to use, actually I found this in a Zoe book. And so I'm not prejudiced. And the ones with the widgets, gremlins, and pipinella. You see that? And what they would do, uh, I would tell them how they might do it, and you cut out each one, and then you start aspect sorting. And as you go along, and by the way, third graders love this. <laughs> but this is the kind of test I would give. And then I would ask the assignment, and, you know, and then they need to de develop description for these things using what they collected. You know, it, it's, a, it's an application of everything we talked about all semester. We used to do it in little bits and pieces. And my hour exams would be uh, probably. And uh, I found out it was very good to make pretty good directions. But see, they, we, we studied, in this one, we studied morphology. This is uh, cytogenetics, the chromosomes. This was, uh, the big deal was, when I was doing this, was uh, the chemical components of the uh, organism. And this is the data I collected from A, B, C, you know. And what they were supposed to do is take this information and determine whether A is more closely related to B or C, and vice versa. We've talked about it. They, they, in lab, they learn all the parts of the flower, and this is in uh, 
systematics of flowering plants, and you know how you can use different fields of study to determine relationships. Now, now they're going to do everything by DNA analysis. Maybe we won't have to do all this stuff. But uh, anyway, you know. But it was to give them, and I. They, it's a take home. And they had to show me it, it was their own work. But by then, you generally know them well enough. You know, if you see the same sentence six times or something, something silly, you know. And, uh, but anyway, what I uh, had to do with each course was, like, I went there and I knew, and I told Brian this and he was kind of I knew exactly how not to teach plant morphology. <laughs> I thought it, you know, when I went there, and they put me in quite my you know. So I had to uh, figure out a way. Well, what I did is I went in and I got all, well, we do mosses, okay? I go get that. Everything I could find on mosses, you know, in the lab, and I go out and collect them and everything. And they had a textbook, and uh, me, and uh, they used bold, and uh, the textbook had a, and that book, by the way, had a very good index, <laughs> and a very good glossary. And I would tell them that anything they saw for the first time, they could ask me what it was called. You know, that's that first thing. And they would, uh, you know, uh, basically figure out the life cycle for the mosses and list, you know, they're all, they all have basically the same one, but, you know, there's variations on certain structures. They learn that. They learn about variation and constancy. And I had a student who was a bacteriologist never took a course under me, but when she was a senior and she decided she wanted to take a course with me because she heard they were weird. <laughs> <laughs> and she was really bright. And she came in and took a course on the morphology of vascular, no, of uh, plant. And when it was all over with, uh, she said, you know, you're sneaky. <laughs> That's the first, I didn't, I told them they didn't have to read the book, they didn't want to, you know. That was the first book that she read every word. And, there, and the, her glossary thing was, and her index thing was kind of blackish in there. And she read everything under every picture in there. <laughs> and never told them to read the book. It's a tool. It's a tool. It's like, I'm a tool. The, the only thing that uh, isn't is the plant, to me. You know, in a botany course, and it would be the animal you're working with. So, she uh, told me afterwards that if she'd taken this course as a sophomore, she wouldn't be a bacterial uh, microbiologist. Because <laughs> she thought all plants did was sit there and grow. See? So, but I, I figured out how to do that, and uh, we had uh, uh, two labs with the, like, I arranged my course uh, at a time. I'd have a, because you had to have lectures and labs, see. So I'd put a lecture and have the lab right after it. And then on Friday, wait, they, that time was already blocked out, because it was Monday and Wednesday, and, uh, we have a, and we discuss it. And these kids, students would be up there drawing pictures on the board, you know, because what they learned that week was what we discussed for basically two hours. And they discussed it. And they used me as a tool, and the book as a tool. And they would argue, you know, they get in an argument and they just go get the book or, and, and things like this. So they were thinking thinking. And I was sneaky. 
So how many okay. students were in your? I'm sorry. System, how many students were like typically in your systematic botany class? How big? How, yeah. how many students? Oh, it it varied. Uh, they weren't big classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did this with genetics, and I taught uh, every student, we had biology and genetics for, you know, and I grew, uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, genetics wasn't very old when I first went out. And uh, we, what we did with labs and things, I thought they needed to know techniques and, and organisms that were used in Y and all that, and uh, then I would, uh, uh, I, I generally got pretty good lab assistants in that, even though we didn't have a PhD program. I picked him. <laughs> you know, and uh, we would, uh, they would do the, the lab experiments and discuss them and then in lecture, uh, I would have sometimes as many as 25 students. And, uh, uh, I always stop lecturing after about a half an hour because we're, we're storytelling or whatever you want to call it. And, and then we would have a discussion. But we were always in the, the labs because um, I, had some, I was lucky enough to have students that were there not during the lab period because, you know those dumb plants and animals forget to read the book? You know, they, they say that the Drosophila life cycle is and it comes in on Sunday morning, you know, and they would, you know, I would come in and let them in to go do their thing. And they learned a lot about organisms, and you know, they don't always read the book. And uh, that's when I lived in town. <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, you know, there's some things you can do better by talking about it or lecturing or whatever you want to call it. And there are other things you can do better uh, hands-on. And to me, biology is, is experimental. It's, it's really, you know, we did, really didn't know much about biology until the 1930s, you know. And uh, we, uh, you know, the, you, have, you sit down and you say, uh, I'm always doing this. Now, if we do this project, what do I want them to learn from? Okay, now, how do I turn that around and get them to want to learn? You know, I say, I, I'm a teacher. I did research to get promoted. <laughs> you know, and that kind of stuff. I played by the rules, but my uh, uh, whole life is, is, is teaching and learning. And you learn so much from doing research, so you, you get that little ping every now and then when something clicks. Uh, that's, that's very important. And, uh, uh, but you, to me, in designing a course or something, you have to sit down and really figure out what is this about? Not what somebody said in a book, but what, because see, in, why I don't like textbooks, I remember when they came out in DNA and they put it at the front of the genetics book. They had no history on how we got there. They didn't know that we didn't know what sperm and egg did. We didn't know uh, you know, with the, the uh, chromosomes were. We didn't know what they were. And yet we were trying to explain a big biological process. You know, and so you, you, you have to change it as new information comes in. And you hope you gave, give them the ability to do that too. That's what learning never stopped. So I would sit down and uh, and and, and if, if it was an ideal situation, you know, what would I have them do? How would I best explain? There's some things that are better explained biological principles using animals, some bacteria, some plants. 
you know, if you want to find mitosis, it's easy to find it in plants. Go find it, you know, try to find it in animals. You know, and if you're teaching biology, it doesn't matter where you find it. It's that it's found. And it, it, it's a way to teach. So this is, this is what I wanted to do in our biology, regular biology, but they only had me teach that one. So they were doing the same recipe book that they've been doing for 50 years. And so biology had changed. To Mary and I'm trying to relate oh. your, your these principles. So th this is this is your oh the, now, your syllabus for the for your for the class. Systematic. Right. Yeah. So I mean but the <coughs> are involved. Yeah, but how I mean I did so I these, these, these are these are philosophical principles, but the question yeah. question I have. So I mean how did you engage what were the questions that you used to engage the students? To learn these concepts. Okay, I would give them a situation like when I introduced the, the course. There's all kinds of situations, and then I would uh, mention to the, 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 I, I think I blew their minds up on the first day, but like we, I would uh, tell them, okay, this is a biology course. Now, biology involves this, you know, and I we go through this. And then I'd say, all right, we're going to take this segment of biology. Now, how many of these apply to this? And I would have it all over the board. I like to draw. And, uh, but you start out, okay, with the course. You start out, okay, where do I want them to end? How do I start and get them there? Now that's philosophical. I'm sorry, I, I, but that's the way I do it. So what I uh, I do is I I try to you got to introduce the course and you got to explain certain terms because they're the same word. You know, there's 154 definitions for the word run in the dictionary. I learned that from the job. And I went down there. By God. <laughs> Webster. But you know, you, you got to give them terminology, but you don't want to give them too, too fast. So what you do is, what I do is, okay, okay, now they need to, when they get down uh, with this course, what, uh, you know, they need to know what an organism is. They, you know, you just start listing these. Now, uh, these premises are after I do everything. But I wanted them to, to, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 some of it sounds really important. A unit of comparison or study is a character. What's a character? How do you find characters? And, and it is. So I, I start out like this and then, okay, how does that get me to what I think they need to do? Sometimes I made my uh, finals at the beginning of the court. You know, and then I would see if I got there. And then I would rewrite things. But you have enough background in, 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 uh, to know basically you, where you're going you know and all you, you uh, and you need to and you have a pretty good bat idea of the first thing and like when you go into the lecture room the first thing you do is tell them what your name is you know you know that now it's this other stuff and I'm, I'm making it simplistic may seem simplistic to you but it's not you have to get it really down so you can act expand upon it. But you start with, you know, when I first time I taught systematic botany, I thought I knew a lot. You know, how am I going to fit everything I know in a semester? Well, the first thing I had to learn is you can't. Because it took me 18, eight years to learn it. You know, so you have, but you will go in 
I don't know what I did. Maybe with grandiose ideas. <laughs> and you have, but you have an idea of where you want to get. Now you have to figure out where do I start? And that depends on what your student are. Yeah. You got to be flexible, especially the first two times you, you do it. I, ch I change them every semester. Uh, and, but you know, you have things to base it on, like systematic botany. I have all this stuff. Because I took systematic botany and I took it from John Davison and I thought it was the greatest course I've took. You know. So I knew where they, I wanted them to get. <laughs> you know. And then I had to go back and say, how do I get there? So uh, I think you guys have a, uh, uh, you're going to try and determine what to teach the first few years of a biologist, really have a, quite a project ahead of you. <coughs> because where were you after your first two years of biology? You know, and where was science after you've learned the first two years of biology? You have these questions, you know, and we split it up into biology to me and biology, as long as it involves anything in biology. But, you know, it's so complicated now. We have things like ecology and genetics. Did you know that they never meshed until 1949? The ecologists thought all variation was due to the environment, and the geneticists thought all variation was due to the genetics material, and they didn't get together and figure out how. Uh -uh, it's both. <laughs> you know, J.E. Weaver, did you ever meet him? No. I was told when I walked in the building as a graduate student, don't mention the word genetics to J.E. and because he was an old school ecologist, and he was famous. He was a good writer, and he did a lot of good work. He really did. But he believed in fixed age species. And you could read his book, and it made sense, until you realized he believed that. You know, and they did. It wasn't until Huxley, who was a grandnephew of Thomas Huxley, who was with Darwin, he pulled it all together in the late 40s and got, got him to say, listen, let's get this together on this. We're talking about the same thing from different angles. You know, and so this is, I think we're doing that. Uh, <laughs> I got lost. Huh? I said I got lost. Yeah, but you know, when you're doing this, though, uh, you get all kinds of things coming in, but thing I think I was telling you about uh, things change as you as you go along. And then when a, a botanist studies development and a zoologist studies development, what's in common? You know, what what's in common? Okay, then go. Okay, how are they different? Now, how do we get there? You know, from that because. Science is not static. You know that. I won't tell you that. But teaching, you see, I am a teacher. And I've had, I've been taught a lot of different ways, and I think it's so much fun. That, and I want my students to have fun. But you're all here because you're curious and, and, and you want to teach. I'm assuming. Is that a room use or something? <laughs> but anyway. But we all learn different, and uh, but, uh, and I'm a systematist. You know what that means? Systematic. <laughs> how do I get from A to B? You know, and how, and and to D, and that's going to be your big thing. Which is the best way to show a principle in zoology? Is it some of them are best shown in animals, and then you have to somewhere along the way you show it how it also happens in plants, you know. We may talk about bacteria. That's what's beautiful about it. 
you can you'll have so many different things. And they're the principles are basically the same in all of them, except the results are different. And you have to keep Am I getting too as well, a very a bit. He I has mean, to just keep to be online because I get to go it. back. I mean, so so your your laboratories and your lectures were sort of integrated together. Yeah, right? but see, I, I planned my courses, uh, and they got uh, some of the guys really got mad when they figured out what I did. <laughs> that lecture and lab, like we, I do all day, all afternoon, really, and two afternoons a week. And, and then two after or in the morning, I had to get my lectures and my labs at like two, uh, lab, two at, labs a week from nine to twelve or whatever it was, and you introduce whatever you needed to do, and then it was in your lab, and then you relate it back to them. Is that the, what you're talking about? Yeah. So I, I think your lab, just from the outline that you have, your yeah, we went out in the field a lot. Yeah, you did both. You did yeah, feel but that. we have blocks of time. So the and lecture, the lecture, and the lab were basically right at the same at the same block of time, right? Yeah, you 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 give them unique. a new you give them a new thing to see, and they have to learn that, yeah. and then you can talk about it, or you can introduce it. They can go look at it, and then they can talk about it. It's all. Oh, but you know, I had a lot of three-hour blocks, but I figured out how to have Fridays off. So I can go watch clown. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, I have uh, another meeting okay. that I have to go But, uh, you know, I, I always thought that was, you know, if you had a three-hour block and you figured out, do I start it out talking, you know, or, you know, do I... Uh, have a diagram on the board or whatever, and we start from that. I like to start from ground yeah. down, diagram. And but you have time to do that, and you can use all their learning skills and all their creativity. And they're all their creativity all at once. Mm. But I had a, uh, you know, I, I ended up with. Uh, the TAs that mostly I'd had in classes <coughs> and they just were great. The graduate students I had a little trouble with. I had one genetics student because uh, in genetics uh, I told him if he couldn't inter introduce the subject that they're doing in lab in 15 minutes, he's talking too much. They're in this lab to do. He came from UK. So let me ask you this, <laughs> Mary. He didn't ask very long. So, so with yeah. with systematics, mm -hmm. a lot of this is very visual, very mm -hmm. hands-on mm -hmm. uh, type experimental stuff. Yeah. What so, am I doing? Yeah. So, so what what did you do for genetics, where you can't oh, do genetics. quite as many? Uh, we had uh, <coughs> an awful lot of the same way. Uh, I would go in and uh, introduce uh, a subject of genetics. You know, it's a lot like this, but different, a little different work. But I had a tendency of teaching genetics historically because, uh, like I said before, I didn't like new textbooks because they always put the latest thing they've learned in the beginning and they have no background to figure out what it is. Mm. You know, uh, and so I teach genetics, this story, and it's hysterical sometimes. <laughs> you know, because we didn't know what sperm and egg were for so long. And these kids don't know that. Yeah. Everybody knows about sperm and egg. You know, they didn't know that, uh, uh, anything about diseases, <coughs> and which I think is a lot of genetics. And, uh, the, you know, you sit there and I, I would have my students go home and boil up some spaghetti and put it on the refrigerator and bring it in class and figure out what plant group they belong to. You know, things like this. And they couldn't believe. And neither could we. You know, in the uh, age to the ages. So I, uh, but I thought they ought to know something about all the 
or most of the major organisms that we learn genetics from. You know, the, we start out with big things and try to figure out with pedigrees and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we're down to the DNA now. And they learn a lot of genetics, but they learn it as it was learned. And I bring in things that, uh, well, it's like when they figured out DNA. It only has four bases. It can't be. The DNA can't be the genetic material. It isn't complicated enough. You know, so they went after protein. Well, you know, that's a logical assumption until you think about the alphabet. All of this has only 26 letters in it. <laughs> you know, and as you get to this concept, and with DNA, these, they had to separate it, you know, from the, from the protein. You know how they did that? Put some water in a wearing blender and put in some leaves or something and push the, the button on a blender. You know that's kind of rough. And they chop it up. And they didn't realize it was in big long strands. You know? And then they had to go to the physicists and learn about the Fibonacci angle. Is that the right thing? Fibonacci. You know, the one that makes the double helix. I have trouble with certain, with F-A-B-B-I. Yes. You know, a pine cone, have you ever taken a pine cone and held it like What's this that? and spun it and it's you get spiral? Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's a physical phenomenon that biology uses. If you want to put a lot of stuff in a little bit of space, you do it that way, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, then they, 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 they break it up and everything. So, you know, and then uh, I take them step by step, you know, every step of, of the history of when they, you know, how they did this, what was their logic behind it, what was their problems behind it, you know, and all this kind of stuff. What door are we pounding on now to get through? I'm really curious about what the exams look like. What? <laughs> what, what? What did the exams look like in your class? <laughs> the examples? Exams. Uh, oh, you're that's interested that's in that. that. Uh, <coughs> you could use them. Did you, get, did you get these? Yeah, yeah. Well, see, what I do is, uh, in, uh, during the semester, we have, uh, they have to learn the terms. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't think that, and so what I do is I create problems. Now, if you look to Saul, I do this in genetics, too. Now, we, in this one, we use three, one, two, three, four, and we were trying to determine, figure out relationships. Because mm -hmm. that's what classification is all based on. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, I took a, these are the ones that we, did in that period of time, and I made this up so I get my answer. <laughs> you know, and then I we carry this problem or a problem like this and do the next part of the thing. And I would get, but these are the kinds of exams I would get because uh, it, it, you have to learn to look at the data, mm -hmm. and it's always Interpret. represented interpretation. Interpretation yeah. of data. Uh, because, you know, sometimes students are, are young they students, don't usually uh, they're looking for the discrete, simple answer. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and that's and the beauty of it. They resist uh, the, the thinking process, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you, with this, it's very hard not to uh, do the hard part. Mm -hmm. You know. It, 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 when you give them a problem with kinds of data, and that bi uh, biology, any learning field is data. Now what do you do with it? And this is uh, 
uh, in systematics, these are the various fields that uh, data, because see, taxonomy has no data. It's collected from other fields of study, <coughs> systematic. You know, if you measure one leaf, one plant leaf length, you have to measure them all. And that is morphology. <laughs> so what we do is we accumulate data from different fields uh, of study, of data collecting. Okay, so we took morphology. We discussed morphology. They saw morphology. They've been keying out plants and reading descriptions and all that in lab. And I'm showing them the stuff out in the field. We'll pick up a posy and I say, okay, how many petals does that? You know, how you know how are they arranged and all this. And so what they do is they've been exposed to this of both lecture and lab wise. I'm a firm believer in field uh, trips because it builds camaraderie, if nothing else. They, get, they start trusting one another and me. You know, getting out of the hot ivory tower. But see, here I took five morphological characters. Okay? And then this one group they sorted, like those little widgets Kremlin say, and this is, they found out the stems were creepy, and they were hairy, really hairy. <laughs> and then the leaves are tire and fleshy, they're two characters. So what you have here are four characters, four, eight characters, morphological characters, and you try to figure out, you learn from this that this is an intermediate, generally, between this okay. and this. You see? Yep. And then you look at this and her suit laborious is uh, not hairs. They learn words too. And pillows is really long hairs. You know? And so uh, it looks like the two extremes are here and the middle is there. And, you know, the other end. I don't put it in there so all the characters uh, or one's gene, because I want to get across the point that you only get half your genetic material from either parent. And you can get intermediates, or you can get dominants and recessives, you know, this kind of stuff. Now that's genetics, but you know. And, uh, but anyway, they have eight characters. And you're trying to figure out you find out, if you look at those numbers and things, that you will get uh, a kind of a curve. You know, it, it, well, not a curve, a bar graph. And you get different bar graphs, sets. And uh, you find out that the glabers doesn't, doesn't go with serrate normally. Uh, you know, or whatever it is. And you get, and it, it, maybe the breeding will help you better, but if you cross <coughs> A and A, mm -hmm. is that how that goes? Breeding day, A, A. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we get? What did it say there? I must have left, left that a page. But, uh, well, if you cross C with C, you got 7% mm -hmm. of your breeding. Uh, your uh, Bible C. Mm -hmm. That's not very good. But if you cross A with C, you got 82%. Uh, yeah. So you sit there and you can bar graph that or whatever you want, but what you end up finding here is you have two species, but I, I made it, I know it, and hybrids. But, you know, it's, it's the data um, data, mm -hmm. but see, uh, this is between here and here. Mm -hmm. This All means right. there's no crossbreeding. Yeah. Okay. Right. So there's a pretty good genetic barrier there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, am I getting it to Yeah. yeah. No this worries. is genetic. <laughs> Breeding data is genetics to me. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now see, this one, if you cross A and B, you get A, T. Mm -hmm. But when you cross B and B, uh, you know, they're uh, pretty stable. Mm -hmm. You know, they're so, so much alike. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so on. And you'll find out that that these characters do they have uh, the morphological characters? You, that's generally what you start with because you can see it. But that you can see a pattern. Okay. And you look at the breeding, and you see a pattern. And you look at other data, and you'll see a pattern. Now, is it the same pattern? With all the data. Data? I forget. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? And so you can say here that in this thing, uh, when you cross B with B, yeah. with a B and a B, uh, you get 77% because you never, uh, very rarely get 100%. Uh, sperm and egg fusing and producing a health print. Yeah. But that's indicates a very close relationship, okay? Now this, uh, B and C are further apart. And then you do C and C, and you find out uh, that C and C have a high sterility barrier. Mm -hmm. Could be a hybrid, you know? Okay. It could be in the middle, see? Right. And, and am, I, am I getting there? Yes. It's been 12 years since I tried this. And, uh, but anyway, you take this kind of data and you, you have to sit there and figure it out. Uh, high percent means the higher uh, seat set or whatever, generally the more similar they are. The lower the seat, generally, is they're further apart. Mm -hmm. okay. And you can, you can do this really with insects, my friend says. Mm -hmm. She bombs okay. trees and uh, <laughs> sulfur trees and... Uh, are you the <laughs> entomologist? No, no, she's, she's the entomologist. The, yeah. He's the geneticist. She, she, she worked with... Uh, you flies. work yes. with yeah. 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 Drosophila. Oh, I, I used to maintain Miller's, Miller's oh, you, oh, you Drosophila <laughs> uh, one summer. So, so in, in milk bottles, pipe milk bottles. Yeah, Very, okay, so Very. this is viability. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. I've talked about breeding data, it's mm -hmm. genetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry with that. And see, uh, you, you, you have to know what these mean. So you have to have a good glossary. Okay? And like leaves, the entire means they have the outline is good, but they're fleshy. You can squeeze them. And these are lobed mm -hmm. and they're real skinny. Okay? I try to get and they're and these are serrate, meaning two, that's the opposite of that. And you know, I don't know which, I mean, you have to study which is in the middle, you know. And, uh, but they're all uh, characters from different fields, this is why I like systematics, of different fields of botany. You have to know a lot of botany. Sometimes I don't know a lot of botany. And then, even here, you have to know a little bit about chemistry. You have to know a little paper. So, but, but to go back to his original question, so, Huh? You, these you, these exams, you you said these were take-home exams, right? An awful lot of my exams were uh, take-home exams. That's so it. they didn't have to do <laughs> this. <laughs> huh? They didn't have to do this on the spot. No, no. So how did and you? We'd, uh, and we and what? So were, did they work together on these? Well, I tell them it should be their own work. But all you have to do is tell them that, right? You know, follow <laughs> order. But they do know, see I have a quirky mind. They find that out very early. I, I catch them using the same phrases. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just say, oh, who, who, who is the originator of this? 
Yeah. Yeah, you, can, you can't just skim read them. But if you, you, you see patterns of words, I don't care if they discuss it, but the end product has to be there. So, so is, was this like a final exam question? Mm -hmm. and, that would be a final exam. But actually, uh, I, this was an hour exam, I think. And uh, then the, the final was a take home exam. Too. But this is in case you know you have a bad day on the take home or you know, a bad time on the take home. I believe in backups, but if you give a a final exam, that's and the, the uh, what is it? I lost the word again. Yeah. Comprehensive. Comprehensive. Uh, uh, you know, you can have a bad day on that too, and you need backups. You know, kids can just have a bad day. I, I'm sorry, I'm getting dizzy. So, so, uh, so whatever, but whatever grade they they made on the final exam, it's the highest they do. Uh, no, see, I, that's the way I learned. I couldn't, I couldn't do bits and pieces. Well, I'm, I, I, I think I. Hold on, I don't know that we got any Nessies in there. Oh, Uncle Charlie. Marion. There's somebody. I'd like you to have this. Oh, <laughs> yes, I remember. Uh, if you didn't cook it just right, it crystallized, or it was sloopy. I got pretty good by the end of the summer. <laughs> I bet you do. So, ah, uh, good. So I think that the... the is this mine now? It's yours now. What, what it's mine. Now? I got a... Uh, did they make these anymore? That's a, that's a Lincoln. Yeah. had a, a Lincoln a Dairy original. <laughs> Slow <laughs> it is. What thing is, and that's what I did one summer to go to summer school. What, what perhaps we should have done was uh, <sighs> let you ask questions about how she set up her course. So, for you know, rather than explain the premises, so the premises are basically the fundamentals for understanding the questions mm -hmm. that she was trying to get the students to answer. And you so like telling my student, you don't ask very many questions and I get bad. He asks the good ones. I have a question. Good. <laughs> so how would you how would you introduce them to the earlier historical time when we didn't know what sperm were, when we didn't know what eggs were? How would you begin them on that path? How would you get them started on the on on thinking about? Well, uh, you know, I, I always tried to sh show them that like anything, uh, uh, the more we learn, the more there is to learn, you know, I'm not doing this very well. And, you know, they knew, and now it's like with the sperm and the egg, it's, I, I always say, did you know? You know, like this. And they all just sit there and, oh, you're kidding. Who believes that? <laughs> you know? And then I, I, would, I would explain how, you know, they, they knew it happened, but they didn't know how. So what you have to do is you, uh, we had to wait for good microscopes for one thing, you know. And, and other people working on it. It wasn't done in a vacuum. I, I like to tell them that. And that, okay. Uh, and then I give uh, would give them kind of uh, examples, uh, questions that they were asking them. Mm -hmm. am, am I answering your question? Or? You are. Yeah. It's like, uh, how come cows produce cows? And we had the, that was a, a little, uh, a, a perfectly good question, and it got us to thinking, you know, there had to be something. It wasn't just spontaneous, so, but they didn't have a lot of data, uh, you know, information. And then you show them how they build up the, the information, and finally a door opens. Yeah, so yeah, that, that sounds I, really good. It, uh, introducing the questions of the, of the of the day, introducing the issues of the day, questions of the day. Yeah. It's like a really yeah. good way to get that rolling. Yeah. 
did you know we used to believe this? And they're aghast a lot of times. And then you give them why, they give them a little information of why they, you know, they thought that was it. You know, like the little humanals in the sperm that guy found. Oh, there's some old book I found up No, that's there. right. You know, uh, there was a little man in a sperm. Hum humunculus. Or a thingy humunculus. in a sperm. And I always thought it was funny it was in the sperm and not the egg. <laughs> <laughs> But we had to wait, and uh, it, it was published, by the way, this little thing. And I couldn't believe how anybody could believe that. And they they can't either in this day. They, they can't believe that. And you say, then you show them how historically we got better microscopes, we got better this and that, and 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 it started expanding everything. You know and. Finally, they did found out that that little humanal was the nucleus. What you know, and there's a nucleus in an egg, you know. And they started putting these pieces together. It's like a puzzle. The history of science, I think, is. And <coughs> you, you, but see, they can't believe it. You know, and I, I told them that we knew uh, genetics. Uh, a long, for a long time, and we knew that uh, cows made cows and cat, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But they used to believe it, uh, and this always shocks them, they thought it was uh, the menstrual fluid and the uh, semen and, uh, got together, and somehow or other they got all these little particles that told them how to make a liver. You know, all the, you know, they, they didn't know anything about genes. And they, but they would, they would work with what they have at the time. And it is not silly to them at the time, you know. And then when they do that, they start refining it uh, and, and, and bringing in more information and, and we're able to uh, we get the technology. That's, what we have to wait for a long time. And uh, that happens with most everything in, in science. So in genetics, I, I, told, I tell them, you know, they, they used to believe this. They used to believe that. And they knew that somehow both parents contributed to the progeny, but they had no idea how oh, they didn't uh, they hadn't seen chromosomes they didn't know what the genetic material is and and then you show them how they figure and i i like history but you know more and more data comes in it doesn't fit their hypothesis so they have to reevaluate and and change course a little bit. And then, what I think is interesting in science is that we get so far <coughs> and then we hit a, a door. It's very true and uh, uh, maybe technology. They didn't know what bacteria was because they might be able to make telescopes but they didn't make microscopes. How simple. You know, and when they, uh, found the microscope, they opened up a whole different world. And all these, you, they had to sort through everything to see what to keep and what not to keep. You know, and sometimes you have to go backwards and get something throughout and come in. And, and, come in. and they get, they build up a, 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 con, a process and they, they see uh, what a researcher does, in a sense. You know, you have a hypothesis, you collect data, and you may have to change the hypothesis. That, but your data, is, uh, in the old days, uh, is more elaborate now. You know, we have more uh, data. And sometimes we have to throw things away. We misinterpreted it, because we didn't have enough information. <coughs> And this is the way I do 
genetics because I grew up with genetics. You know, and I used to, uh, 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 it's just like I, I go in, I remember going into one class because I reread something and I said, do you, how many of you have been born at, uh, before 1947 or something like that? And they look at me and I say, well, you, you know, you guys all have 46 chromosomes, but I was born before 1947 and I have 48. And they'll look at me, you know, and finally somebody will say, how come? You know, and I said, well, I don't know exactly, but I think it was an ambitious, obnoxious graduate student that read that number 48 and said, I wonder if that's really true. And he went back, let's see, it was in the published records. That was in my biology book. Mm -hmm. You know? It's amazing. And we have to do that. This is the process of science. I forgot that. And you do it in all of them. <coughs> and this is one reason why, uh, well, I... I uh, What's intriguing? People asked me once, what was in the next field of science going to be, uh, of genetics? The students said, where are we going with genetics? You know, and I told them, well, we're going to go into uh, uh, developmental genetics. And they go, why? Mm, I don't like why, of course, you know, but what'd you pick that for? <laughs> That's the way to get around. And I said, well, we've got all this data, you know, about developmental biology, and we have all this data about inheritance, and we've got all this stuff in between it. What's, in, what's real? What's important? What, what is... Uh, they said, what, when, and how, and thank God, and I'll ask them. And, and I said, some of the things that we believed in, we, th you guys think are silly, because we were in the sorting process. And that's science. You see what I'm, that's why I like to do it historically. Is because you can show, you can take an example of something now that we we know isn't true, but we didn't at one time know it. It's just like the germ disease things that bacteria. You, what they did, they did, didn't believe it in the United States because something that little could not topple something that big. You know, and they they just wouldn't believe it. And the Europeans believed it before we did. And uh, I'm sure you that's know, really an important thing. That, that and mistakes. I told them that uh, you know we'll go along. It's just like vaccines. That was a mistake. You know, the graduate student forgot to put the lid on the chicken meat for pasture. I think it was pasture. Maybe it was Lister. And he came back on a vacation or something, and uh, they decided to inject the old stuff into chicken, and uh, it wasn't as strong. But then, they, <coughs> well, they thought, well, we'll infect, infect them with the new clean stuff. And the chickens were immune, <laughs> you know? And they'll sit there and they that need story. to, you didn't understand that? I never heard that story. Oh. Yeah, well, that happened with Pasteur, who, by the way, was a chemist originally, but he could work with little things, you know, he could picture. He, that was his beauty. He could picture something you couldn't see, you know. But that was one of the experiments. Yeah. They, they were working with chicken collar. I'm amazed that guy wasn't dead. He worked with anthrax, too. No. You know, but he, he, he did his chicken there trying to figure out how to, and uh, I think it was uh, Lester, the, was it Lester, one of them of that generation figured out how to make serum for vaccination. And that's why if you get, if, if originally if you got smallpox, 
and you went and inject people with cowpox. Because <coughs> cowpox didn't do as well in humans. But your immune system, am I right on that? You, you keep telling me, do you know about that kind of stuff? Does lecture. it make sense? It's my lecture in two classes. Yeah, but anyway, uh, you know, then, but they, they find, you know, they, a lot of things are serendipitous and funny, but uh, we, we just couldn't believe that those little bitty things in uh, Van Lundlund, or whatever his name is, drinking water. Can you imagine what he felt like when he looked at his drinking water under a microscope? Yeah, you know, anyway, the point yeah, is... But the point is that doing it historically, you could, yeah. you have something to compare. And the students can say, how could they ever believe that? You know, in parallel, and you get them to thinking about that. In parallel, you can teach them the process of science. Huh? In yeah. parallel, you can teach them the process of mm -hmm. doing science, which yeah. is, a lot of people feel, is one of our greatest deficiencies in science education. That we yeah. don't do a good enough job of teaching students how we do science. Right. Yeah. And in fact, you and know, now, what's, what's uh, happened in the textbooks is that, yeah. it, well, what's happened in the textbooks, so it used to be that in the chapter on, on DNA structure and replication, <coughs> it had all of these foundational experiments that led up to demonstration that DNA was the genetic material, Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it's DNA, not protein, and all that. But, but they're cutting those out of the new versions of the textbooks, and they go immediately to a double helix. And, <coughs> and, and, and they really yeah, don't. I don't like that, actually. And, yeah. and they can't conceive it. Well, you know, exclusively, no. uh, Well, it, 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 it's too big a leap handle. for them, in a sense. No, 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 but I'm just saying that in the, in the, in the chapter on DNA structure and replication, mm -hmm. they used to have you know, Avery's experiment and Mendel and Stahl's experiment. We do that. Well, I'm mm -hmm. just telling you the new versions of the textbook, but they're, they're cutting those things out. Yeah, well see, mm -hmm. they have to keep them skinny, so well, the, they think the old stuff, well, everybody the knows. The more the better, right? That's the problem. It. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, a mile wide and, and a half an inch deep is, mm -hmm. is what it is, so that um, yeah, you know, and why you have to put in things with micro rays and uh, and uh, all this technology what they put in now? Well, see, I don't do that. I skip that. Well, I, I understand, but I mean, it's, for I an introductory for an introductory biology book, I don't know that micro rays are really all that. They're not very useful because we're not going to use them anymore anyway. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's true. But, uh, no, it's I, I, two I, years old. I'm sorry. There's a, fault, there's a faulty assumption. I think a lot of kids are coming out of high school knowing, knowing that, um, not, not even just some AP biology, but uh, just my, my my daughter's a senior now, and just uh, seeing what they uh, picked up in high school, in, in the high school science classes, and uh, I mean they've talked a little bit about, about the structure of DNA, but I think there's a certain assumption that that, that is known um, uh, as they're coming into college. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think it's a faulty assumption, but uh, I think mm -hmm. it's being made. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly important to understand those experiments if you're going to have the concept of how DNA works and, and what mutations are. And, and the discovery. I think the discovery part was the important thing yeah. to emphasize. Yeah. How did we know? How did we know what now? How did we know that DNA was the genetic material? How did we learn that? Uh, how did we actually... And that's the history. So that's why you do the history. Yeah. Well, they, uh, how did Mendel ever figure out how genetics work without knowing about sexuality? E yeah. We knew about that. Yeah. Okay. Meiosis, he didn't know about that. That yeah. was all done after. I didn't know no. that there were two, he, two alleles in every gene, every yeah. individual. I just, right. The inference, I, I, whenever I teach that, I, I still am a little flabbergasted by how much you put together. He probably time traveled. 
<laughs> yeah. There's a whole school, well, you know, uh, a whole school of thought that he made it up. With, because it always, uh, came, it always came, it was too good. So in, in genetics a few years ago, in the, uh, the, uh, the, they had that series of articles um, addressing, you know, did Mendel fabricate his data because it almost looked too perfect to explain. Um, yeah, but in that book that you're reading, I don't know if you've got that for you, but I mean, Mendel had a lot more information than he's credited for. Oh, I didn't pick up them for it. Huh. Yeah. What's that book, right? Uh, a guinea pig's history of biology. It's terrific. Oh, that was what the one he told you to read. Yeah. <laughs> Good, terrific. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I can't remember. There, there's at least two two geneticists before him that had done a lot of experiments mm. that really, and his and even his parents were doing breeding work, so that I mean he didn't just all of a sudden get this great idea about counting peas. I mean. There was other work that was the foundation of his work, but nobody ever talks. I mean, that's not in the books, and so mm -hmm. you, you don't know that stuff. Well, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. I think Mendel, one problem, because his idea really wasn't uh, agreed upon until the uh, end of the 19th century, is you remember, we're called natural scientists. The others are and uh, uh, we we didn't have any. Uh, well, I'm, I'm looking for a word. Well, for example, Mendel used statistics. That was a big problem with natural sciences. They didn't know. You know, I mean, three fourths and one fourth and things like that. That was a new concept coming out and using. The, those kind of numbers, statistics, to and if something fits, and how well does it fit? That they had trouble with it because most naturalists <coughs> were not high on math. They weren't high on chemistry and physics, you know. And but he used. Uh, I read a story about Mendel where he got up and get, had his paper read and there wasn't a question asked. Wasn't a question asked when he gave up that his paper. Right, got up and read his paper. Because they didn't know how to work with the numbers. You know. And uh, they'd never been applied to anything like that before. And the whole community was confused. Because he, he did something new for biology. You know, it's just like um, a lot of great, uh, I remember Barbara McClintock, and talked about him several times that I read her papers that she wrote in 1944 when I was a graduate student. And uh, in class one time, I said, you know, she, it was about her jumping jeans and corn? Okay. And uh, I mentioned that I, I couldn't see how it worked. I read her paper and I couldn't see how it worked. I said, but someday they're going to find a way to show you how it works. And when it does, she's going to get the Nobel Prize if she lives long enough. Because I just didn't understand it. But she lived long enough. But she, there wasn't an explain, explain until we got bacterial genetics. You know, then it was easier to see how genes turned around, inversions and all that kind of stuff could occur. And that's what it was. Basically, but they they didn't have a mechanism for it, and she lived long enough. I'm so proud of her. <laughs> but uh, uh, a lot of ideas uh, uh, <coughs> have to wait up, wait up, uh, wait for the the technology to catch up and and all that. And to support it. I mean, that happens in any science. And I try to get my students to realize that. 
things. So, so I have a, I figured out the question I want to ask you. Okay. It's a hard question to answer, but okay, so my question is, how do you teach a science course? I know that you. Teach. How do you teach a science course? Like I don't care what, like systematics. Oh wait, no, no, I'm not done. How do you teach a science course without using a without using the textbook? You said you use a textbook as a reference, right? It's a tool. Yeah. yeah. But it's a tool. So, but how do you teach it without a tech without the textbook? Well, they basic without basing it on a textbook. Uh, well, you have to uh, show them other sources if there are any, because we didn't always have textbooks. But you have to be able to... Uh, I mean, how do you organize it? Oh, how do you organize it? <coughs> uh, I don't do it like a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, Sorry, I'm being... No, it, 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 I, I guess what I'm really trying to get at is so... So you organize it based upon on questions, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And because uh, that's what uh, science is. But you have to show students that, at a, you know, uh, it, sometimes you have to wait for the answer. I've had students that have asked me in class, and I'll sit there and say, I should know that. And then I find out why we've hit a door. See, you know what? We go through that. They're, they'll ask questions that we can't answer you right now. But in 10 years, we may be able to. No, they but, really will. But that, that's not my question. My question well, is that how right. do you organize your class? Oh, my class? Without your textbook being the, the way oh, you go through the course. I recommend, I, uh, I'm like, Doc, I, if you want, need a textbook, you get it now. Towards the end, I'd say, look it up on Google and then verify. You know, a textbook, there are mistakes in textbooks and everything else. And the thing is, it's a tool. You can go there and read about it and see if it makes sense. 